Say whatever you want to about the direction or the execution of the Star Wars films, they always give us something new and interesting to geek out about, from lightsabers to Death Stars. And that trend continues in The Last Jedi, where one of the coolest scenes in the film introduces an attack that would change galactic warfare forever. Let's break it down. Before we go any further though, I want to warn you that this video contains spoilers for one scene in The Last Jedi. So if you haven't seen the film and want to see it and don't want to be spoiled, turn back now. I warned you. I warned you again. We don't even have the footage yet. So here we go. In a scene near the end of the film, the Rebellion ship, the Raddus, is outrunning the giant First Order ship, the Supremacy. And then, as a last-ditch effort to help her allies escape to a nearby planet, Vice Admiral Holdo turns the ship at the Supremacy and then makes the jump to hyperspace. Wait! We see what happens in the film, we see the aftermath, but what I'm saying is that according to physics, what we would really see would be even cooler. Like Hoth cool or space cool. It's only three Kelvin out here. Uh, it's, oh yeah, that's better. Ah! Star Wars leans heavily into science fantasy, sure, but weaponizing light speed is taking a page right out of so-called hard science fiction. In fact, weapons that do this already have a name. RKKVs, or Relativistic Kinetic Kill Vehicles. Relativistic because near the speed of light, nothing, not mass, nor space, nor even time, act like we're used to. And Kinetic Kill because these weapon systems accelerate hunks of mass up to incredible velocities and let their kinetic energies do the damage. Wait, slow me down again. RKKVs are sci-fi favorites because there are weird and powerful advantages that come along with moving that close to the universal speed limit C, or 300,000 kilometers per second. The first is detection. Let's say some alien race fires a relativistic kinetic kill vehicle at us, something like a Porg, and we detect it all the way out at Jupiter. When we saw the Porg at Jupiter, because information itself travels at the speed of light, we are seeing the Porg not as it is, but as it was, based on the distance between these two planets about 35 minutes before. And so if the Porg was going relativistic speeds, let's say for example, 99.99% the speed of light, this is literally how much time we would have to react on Earth if we detected a relativistic porg heading at us from Jupiter, all right? Here we go. Detected. Bam! That's it. Just two seconds. The detection problem means that if you can see an RKKV coming, you're probably already doomed. The other advantage of an RKKV is that they are basically unstoppable. Even if you could detect an incoming relativistic weapon, what would you do? Even if you fired something like a proton torpedo at it, when it made contact with the weapon, because that weapon has so much momentum, it's not gonna slow down at all. It's just gonna break apart into many Oh no, many other pieces, and now instead of one projectile, you have many, many projectiles heading at you at relativistic speeds, and unless you have something big in between that and you, like a planet, you're gonna get hit. And it's not gonna be cute. Ah! RKKVs like the Raddus Maneuver aren't just powerful because they are undetectable and unstoppable, though that helps. No, their main advantage is their nearly unlimited power! that they carry. It's not unlimited, but it's a lot. If you've seen this program before, you know we talk a lot about kinetic energy, the energy of motion that objects with mass get as they move equal to one half mass times velocity squared. This equation was formulated by smart boy Isaac, New Isaac Newton, but it is only an approximation. It's an older formula, but it checks out because the things that we observe in our daily lives don't go that fast. But when objects make the jump to light speed, because of how mass and space and even time itself can change with these velocities, we have to instead use a more accurate formula put forth by smart boy Einstein, which is relativistic 
kinetic energy. It replaces velocity with the speed of light squared and one half with gamma minus one. Gamma is named after famed Dutch physicist Hendrik Lu. Come on, special editions, he won a Nobel Prize. Thank you is named after famed Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz. Jeez. And gamma exactly describes how mass, space, and time change as you get close to light speed. And as you can see, the closer that this value for velocity gets to the speed of light, the more gamma tends towards infinity, and therefore kinetic energy will tend toward infinity. That means this is where the fun begins. So let me put this tendency towards infinite energy into perspective for you here. A paperclip going 99.99% the speed of light has the same energy as the bomb that obliterated Hiroshima, Japan during World War II, except 67 times more powerful. A porg going this same velocity has the same amount of energy bound up in its dumb, fluffy little body as a 9.0 earthquake. If a porg and a paperclip have this much potential, imagine what will happen when we scale things up. No! If we bring everything we know about RKKVs into The Last Jedi, we will get a real sense of just how devastating jumping to light speed into something could be. Yeah! Oh, it's broken. Okay, so the Radis and Supremacy are some distance apart and then the Radis makes a jump to hyperspace into the Supremacy. What happens? Well, let's set aside what happens in the film for a second. They have narrative reasons and storylines they need to fulfill. So what really happens according to physics in this scene? Well, first, I don't really think they're making the jump to hyperspace proper or else it would pass right through it, right? So let's assume like we did for the other examples that it is going 99.99% the speed of light. And the Radis canonically is twice as long as a Star Destroyer, so I'm gonna assume it's also twice the mass, around 100 million tons. Finally, they look to be close enough that evasive maneuvers will be impossible. The detection problem we talked about with our KKVs earlier, because the Radis will meet the Supremacy's hull in just milliseconds. Oh, I guess we're transitioning, okay. Wait, how could I be here if I was just transit? The moment before impact, if you could see it, the Radis would look kind of weird. Because of how space itself contracts according to the Lorenz factor, the Radis would not appear it's 3,000 meters long. It would look just 30 meters long. And using the equation for relativistic kinetic energy, this sci-fi pancake would be carrying over 100,000 septillion joules of energy. It is now theoretically more dangerous upon impact than if the ship was composed entirely of antimatter. And then they actually touch. Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going. Oh, here again, I guess it doesn't matter. It will take just a few millionths of a second for the Radis to fully embed itself into the supremacy. And as it does so, the Radis's atoms are moving so quickly with so much energy that it impacts the supremacy like the supremacy was inside of a particle accelerator. The Radis's atoms literally crack open the supremacies and release a shower of subatomic particles and gamma radiation in a sphere expanding at the speed of light. And as it does so, it's heating up material as it goes in the ship to billions of degree Kelvin in a flash of plasma so hot and so furious that our eyes probably wouldn't even register it. The energy carried by the Radis in The Last Jedi, if it was going the speed we're assuming it's going, is enough to vaporize every livable surface on an Earth-sized planet down to its mantle. In real time, all that we would see is maybe a flash of light and then nothing in an instant, just the void, as two ships reduced to just radiation and particles disappeared. 
What's going on here is so violent that to actually see what happens, you would need detectors like they have in the Large Hadron Collider. It would be an invisible catastrophe. And so in one scene, The Last Jedi has potentially changed galactic warfare forever. Relativistic kinetic kill vehicles are so powerful and so unstoppable that every single ship in the Star Wars universe that has a hyperdrive is now potentially a weapon of mass destruction. The fact that the Raddus did not completely obliterate the supremacy like we calculated is incredible. It's either sci-fi armor or plot armor because we are talking about Death Star laser energy levels here. According to the physics, Vice Admiral Holdo's final move was a brilliant one. So the only question I have now is why haven't we seen it before? And will we see it again? Because science, okay, okay, I'm going. Wiped. Okay, spoilers again for one more thing. What you saw in the trailers, if Ray can slice through a rock like butter, then yes, hitting a human person <laughs> with something that can do that to rocks would turn your body into a steam explosion that would rupture you into a bloody mess. Of course, you could just turn the power level down, but could you do more than one thing at once? I think not. What are you, a space wizard? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. A big shout out to the sci-fi blogger Matterbeam for helping me a lot with this episode and getting the science right. Thanks again, dude. If you want more of me, but not of this, check out my Squatch or the space program on projectalpha.com where if you sign up, you can get this show two days earlier than everyone else. Uh, and follow me here. Bye.